I do think there is substantial evidence to suggest that being physically active is a good measure um, for cancer prevention. And, uh, you know, I don't, again, there's also a lot of differences. There are sex differences as well. Like, I don't know why, but in some cases, women respond better, um, you know, and there's certain cancer types that respond better. Lots of variables here. Like, I'm, I feel like I'm speaking in a general way, but like, but like there are lots of things to consider, right? There are cancer types and and there are sex effects and there are, as you mentioned, other covariates. There's obesity and there's, you know, insulin resistance and um, age as well. So, I mean, there are lots of nuanced as, as, as usual, but I do think that you can make the case that like, if you, like, what can I do you know, in my life to, redu- you know, reduce my my risk of getting cancer, reduce my risk of dying from cancer, reduce my risk of getting Alzheimer's disease, reduce my risk from getting dementia, um, reduce my risk from getting cardiovascular disease, reduce my risk for <laughs> type 2 diabetes. Like the only panacea there is is exercise. It's exercise, right? I mean, yep. that, that that is, it is, it is the case. And um, unfortunately, it's the thing that you have to put the most effort in. It's certainly a lot easier to take a supplement, to take a pill. I do think there is an argument that omega-3 is one of the, it's up there, I think. I think getting yourself to a good omega-3 status and defining what that is, is still like being investigated. But um, I do think that's a low-hanging fruit that should not be ignored. But exercise, as you've talked about many of times, is the king, is the king. Um, and and that's that's the thing that you should focus on if you, I mean, any. I mean, obviously, if you're obese, weight loss, exercise is part of that program. And, yeah. and like, like I don't think that anyone that's obese should be worrying about all the other things. Like, they need to like lose weight. And any personal trainer and coach like probably is going to help you do that. Like, just you eat less. Like, that's calories in, calories out. It like matters to some degree. Like, if you're not eating as much. Yeah, but but as you said, exercise matters not just on the energy balance side, but Exercise makes you, for example, more sensitive to satiety hormones. So, um, you know, look, I, I, I have kind of a belief here that the the person who is overweight, uh, the person who is obese and who is clearly eating more than they should be, uh, isn't doing that by choice. Maybe, maybe some are, but, but for the most part, I, it's hard for me to imagine there's someone who's listening to this who's obese, who isn't wanting to not be obese and who is otherwise struggling with hunger, right? Um, And I think that, you know, that's one of the challenges is why is it that a person who is not in energy balance is not responding to the normal satiety signals? And I think there's a lot of reasons. On the food science side, we could talk about a whole bunch of reasons why our food has been hijacked, our food is void of nutrients, our food is hyper palatable, it's far too available. Like, there's a whole bunch of reasons. But I think one thing that doesn't get enough attention is this thing, which is an exercising person has a better sense of nutrient requirement. They have a better, their body physiologically is more in tune with their appetitive needs. And so, even though I don't think exercise matters as much as intake purely on the energy balance side, in other words, I think it's more about reducing input than increasing output, um, a part of that equation is the feedback loop that exercise brings. So yes, exercise just matters. And, and, and I also think that, you know, I, especially in this discussion of cancer and breast cancer as the example you brought up, you know, so many women are so petrified of hormone replacement therapy because of this awful, you know, study, the Women's Health Initiative, which was completely misinterpreted. But just to use one example of what we spoke about, even the people who ran the study, who to this day, some of them, at least a subset, still maintain that conjugated equine estrogen plus MPA, the synthetic progesterone, increased the risk of breast cancer even those people will acknowledge it did not increase breast cancer mortality. So even if you take the most favorable to the WHI, the Women's Health Initiative study reading, the reading is that conjugated equine estrogen plus MPA increased the incidence of breast cancer by 0.1% in absolute risk. 
but did not increase breast cancer mortality. So here you have basically a non-event that has most people panicked senseless, most women panicked senseless when confronted with taking hormones during the perimenopausal period. And yet at the other end of that spectrum, we have a treatment that has more than a log fold benefit in the other direction, i.e. in reducing <laughs> risk. Right. And I wish, I wish people would just allow their attention to be allocated proportionate to the size of the impact.